Uh, what I want to talk with you about today is the FDCPA, so the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And we talked about this a little bit at the end of last week that we would get into these new rules. And what I have on the screen is from the CFPB. And there was the idea that these new rules that were scheduled to go into effect November 30th of this year would actually be delayed. And I'll be honest, I thought they were going to delay it. And what they say is that, uh, let me see if I can highlight this, public comments generally did not support an extension. And the industry said, hey, we'll be ready by November 30, 2021. I'm just telling you, they're not going to be ready. And then this has the actual rules. And so what I'll do is, if you're interested in reading this from the CFPB, I think I can share this. And uh, so if you happen to be on a computer, you may just want to click on it. It should open up in another window and you can just read uh, this little announcement. It also has links to the actual rules that are going to be changed. So we're not going to get into the new rules today. Actually, I'd planned on it. And I thought, you know, it kind of makes more sense to let's start from what the rules are right now. And then it will make more sense to look at how the rules are changing. And again, it's coming really, really quick. You know, it's hard to believe it's, you know, what, August 20th today. And so, you know, November 30 is not very far away. So let me show you uh, what we've got in terms of our presentation materials. And let's see here. Yeah, so I'll close that out. And uh, what I want to do with this is just, you know, really start this series on how do we turn the tables on these abusive debt collectors? Because the way the, the system is set up, we're sort of the hunted ones, right? The collectors are calling us, they're writing us, they're suing us, they're credit reporting on us. And, you know, we're just sort of like back on our heels, you know, trying to defend ourselves. Well, how do we, when they cross the line... How do we go after them? Well, that's the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And, you know, I think everybody that's here, if I look at the list of who we've got, I think you'll fall into this, you know, one of these two categories, but just to make sure. So, you know, if you're a consumer, this will be of interest to you. If you're dealing with debt collectors, like we said, calls or lawsuits or credit reports or whatever it might be. And then we also have some lawyers that typically are on this. And if you're wanting to know, how do I help my clients who are dealing with an abusive debt collector, how do I use as a practical way the FDCPA? And of course, this is true of everything. We have to be willing to do the work. You know, I, I used to hear the expression, I still do some, you know, it's knowledge is power. And that is just absolutely not true. Knowledge is just knowledge. It's potential power, but we have to put it into action. So if I know everything in the world about exercise and I just sit on my couch and I eat donuts and you know drink uh, Dr. Peppers, is that knowledge really that good for me? Well, it doesn't do me any good. I have to actually do something. So we want to learn about the law and then take action. And so if you're interested in that, then I think that this webinar today, and, and there'll be you know several in this series, uh, will be of interest to you. So here's what we're going to cover. First of all, very, very quick overview of the FDCPA. I've got lots of videos where we talk about the FDCPA in detail. This will just be kind of the quick highlights. And then just as a practical matter, what do you get out of a lawsuit against an abusive debt collector if you sue? So if we find that the FDCPA applies, they violated the law, we sue them, what do we get? Is it worth our time? And then the real sort of meat of this webinar will be, I want to put up some examples and have you guys tell me, you know, we'll sort of put up the little scenario first and then is this a violation? Is it not a violation? And then I'll put up some of the applicable uh, case law or not case law, but the actual statute. So uh, let's do the quick overview here. And uh, it, it, the, the real quick version of does the FDCPA apply? Because it does not apply to every debt. Okay. First of all, you have to be a consumer. So not a corporation, 
in almost all situations, not a corporation, not an LLC. You need to be a real live human being. If you're on this webinar, I'm going to assume you are an actual human being. Okay, so that's good. We got that part. And then it's personal debt, not business debt, not uh, I got drunk and crashed into a car and now I'm being sued uh, or I'm being collected on by the other insurance guys. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about personal debt, consumer debt, where generally I took action to take on that debt. I bought the house, the car. I used the credit card. I went to the doctor, went to the hospital, whatever. Okay. And then for the debt collector, who is a debt collector? And that gets a little complicated. I'm just making it real simple here to say, we're talking about a company that really their function as a business is to either buy defaulted debt or collect defaulted debt. That's what they do. So we're not talking about, you know, a company that has 10 million loans and they happen to buy one defaulted loan, they're not going to be a debt collector. Okay. And then fourth, we find a violation of the FDCPA and I have a few examples on here. Maybe they communicate improperly. That's really what we're going to talk about today. It could be they're harassing you or they're lying to you or they're being unfair to you. So this is the quick overview, a consumer, consumer or personal debt, and we're dealing with a debt collector, and then they violate the law in some manner. All right, so what do you get? You know, let, let's say that you're a consumer, it's a consumer debt, you found a debt collector, they broke the law, what do you get? We well, can get what are called statutory damages. That's up to $1,000. Now, you don't have to prove that you were actually harmed. That's your incentive to bring the case. Sadly, that has not been increased since the 1970s. And you know, this year we've seen inflation go crazy. Obviously from 1977 to now, you know, $1,000 is not even remotely worth what it was when they passed this law. They just haven't said, hey, this will increase with sort of the cost of living or inflation. But it, you know, it is what it is. It's $1,000. And then you can get actual or what are called compensatory damages. The idea is, here's where I was before the bad stuff happened. And then that knocked me down to here. Well, that gap is what's necessary to compensate me. Okay, so you could think of, let's take a car wreck. You have a car worth $10,000 after the wreck, it's worth $7,000. Well, $3,000 in damages, okay? So with this, it's going to be either economic damages or emotional distress, sometimes called mental anguish damages. So maybe you get fired from your job because a collector keeps calling your work. And finally, your boss is like, I, I'm done with this. Like, you're fired. We can't have this many calls coming in. And you're making, you know, 20 bucks an hour. And now you're making $10 an hour. Well, you'd have $10 an hour in lost wages, maybe more. Emotional distress is it's upsetting. Maybe they call your neighbors. They call your ex-mother-in-law. You know, all these different things they do. And it's just very, very upsetting to you. Well, again, a jury would figure out, well, here's where you were. Here's the damage. And this is to compensate. It's not to overcompensate, but it's to get you to that compensation level. And, and, you know, a lot of lawyers will tell us, particularly on the other side, they'll say, well, John, you see this for emotional distress. You can't get emotional distress. I said, really? I said, how do you know? They go, well, everybody knows that. You can't get emotional distress damages. I go, you know, it's funny because um, our jury verdicts in federal court in the Northern District of Alabama, which is super, super conservative. Think about it this way. On election night, nobody stays up late going, I wonder if Alabama's going to go Democrat this year. <laughs> okay, that never happens. It's a very conservative area. And I can't think of any emotional stress damage award for less than six figures that we've received on a case that we've tried involving consumer protection statutes. I'm not talking about personal injury or a business dispute. I'm talking about, hey, debt collectors calling my parents or here's what this credit bureau is doing or whatever it might be. That type of case, we have been very successful in emotional stress. Now, I'm not saying every case is worth six figures. A lot of cases are not worth that. You know, a case might be worth 5,000 or 25,000. But the point is, it is possible in the right case to get 
significant emotional distress damages. The next thing is attorney's fees. So your attorney keeps up with his or her time. And then if you're successful, they can file what's called a fee petition to the court. They just go to the court and say, hey, have the debt collector pay me for my time. And I'll tell you this, our hourly rate's $500 an hour. It adds up when we are litigating a case and we're taking depositions and arguing all this stuff. And particularly if we try the case, you can imagine it doesn't take real long for that number to get very, very high. And then there are no punitive damages. Those are to punish, but there are uh, situations where you might can find another federal claim like Fair Credit Reporting Act can have punitive damages or state law claim, uh, invasion of privacy. And uh, certain states have their own sort of uh, specific state laws that can be helpful here that may allow you to get punitive damages. So that is the, uh, what do you get out of it? Okay, now let's go into some examples and let me check the text here to see. I don't think um, have any specific questions. So just good to see everybody. Appreciate you guys being on here. And uh, if, uh, let's see, Joan says, um, a little bit late. That's no problem. And uh, there should be a, an automatic replay link going out. I don't think anything you missed would be that vital. But uh, but anyway, yeah, just in, in case you maybe are watching this on your phone and you, know, you want to be able to watch it again, maybe on a computer, um, you should get that replay link. If you don't, just email me. So let's go with this. And rather than me just sort of lecturing and talking, I really want to get some feedback from you guys and you can just put it in the chat. So a debt collector sends you a text message. Do you think that that violates the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or would that be allowable? Or are you going to go with the ever popular lawyer answer? It depends. <laughs> so uh, give me your thoughts on that, if you will, on, uh, you know, you get a, you, you look down on your phone and you're like, wow, there's a, a message from a debt collector. You know, I wonder, can they do that? And let's see, uh, Maria says it depends. <laughs> Laura says, I'll go with it depends. Yeah. Let's see. Jeff says it's allowed until you tell them to stop communications with you. Okay. So that's certainly an idea there. And Maria says, you know, is this the initial contact? Uh, Eric says, did I revoke the uh, contact info for that number? And, and look, so these are all very good uh, thoughts. So let's look at, uh, yeah, John says about consent. Um, and actually, let me switch out of this and show you. This is the, um, it's law.cornell.edu. And actually, I can share this if you are, uh, probably hard to do it on your phone, but um, if you want this link that will take you straight to the FDCPA. So it's got all the, the different sections here. And uh, this is where, when I'm doing something like this, I just pull from the Cornell Law Library. Uh, it's up to date. It's very, very good. You know, they have just a ton of good information on there. So uh, definitely use that as a resource. So let's get back to the presentation and look at this text message. So I know there's a lot on the screen, but I just wanted to go ahead and put the whole section that applies just so we can look at it. And going back to some of the chats, um, let's see, Marie asked, is this the initial contact? Um, you know, and that makes a difference. So let's look over here. Let me get my cursor on the right screen here. So this is section 1692E11. Now, section E is when we're talking about deceptive conduct. And it basically says, don't have deceptive conduct. And then here are some examples. Well, here's E11. It says, whoops, there we go. All right, the failure to disclose in the initial written communication. So that's what Maria was talking about. Is this the initial contact? Or if it's a verbal communication, then this would also be true. But in our case, text message would be considered written. So in the, in the initial written communication, ah, let me uh, get back here. 
maybe this is part of it. I need to close this little uh, link out. Okay, so, so they have to tell you that they're attempting to collect a debt and any information obtained will be used for that purpose. And then if it's a subsequent communication, they have to point out this is from a debt collector. So sometimes this is called the mini Miranda. So you've seen the cop shows, you know, somebody's arrested, they are read their Miranda rights. Well, this is like the mini, like miniature Miranda rights that, hey, you're dealing with a collector. They're trying to get information from you, trying to collect a debt and any information will be used for that purpose. So when we look at that text message, I say, okay, I got this text message. Is this the initial communication? If it is, well, then does it say in the text message, this is a debt collector attempting to collect a debt. Any information obtained will be used for that purpose. Or if it's a subsequent communication, does it say this is from a debt collector? Now, sometimes what we'll see, and this may be what Maria's talking about, say they're getting clever with this. Sometimes they'll say, well, here's a link. If you click on this link, you'll be given the required disclosures. Well, haven't we been taught if we get some strange text or unknown email and there's a link, you're not supposed to click on that. I think, you know, whoever's running the, what the Democratic National uh, Committee or whatever it's called in 2016, they clicked on the link and, you know, had a bunch of their emails stolen. That's how, you know, you get the stuff from, Regions Bank or Bank of America. It's like, hey, we're having trouble with your account. Click on this link. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's fake. So everybody in, you know, sort of cybersecurity would tell you, don't click on an unknown link. And so, you know, that generally has been ruled to be not effective. In other words, we don't force consumers to be like, well, I don't know, you know, I'm probably going to get like spyware installed on my phone, but I'll click on this link. No, you don't have to do that. It needs to be all in the one message. Kind of hard to do that in a text message. I'll tell you this. The ones that I have seen do not have all that information. And so, for example, I'm filing a suit probably Monday on this exact situation. And then if it's the initial communication, here's 1692G. Okay, it says within five days of the initial communication, then the debt collector has to do something. Now, the initial communication can contain all this, but if it doesn't, then within five days, they've got to get you this information or at least mail it to you. So we're talking about the amount of the debt, name of the creditor, hey, you got 30 days, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it's all this information. Kind of hard to put in a text message. Okay, so is the text message right or wrong? Is it legal or illegal? Well, it can be legal. It can be appropriate, but they've got to put all the disclosures in there. And like Marie pointed out early on, we got to know, is this the initial communication, the initial contact, or is this, you know, uh, contact number 17 that we've been going through? Well, if it's a subsequent one, they still have to tell us it's from a debt collector. They can't, you know, like if I... I sent Maria a text and say, hey, this John, you know, how are you doing? Well, the first time I might say, hey, this is attorney John Watts and, you know, we connected on this webinar. But after that, you know, when we've been going back and forth, just say, I might not even put my name on it, right? It's just, hey, you know, uh, did you see this article that came out? Well, with the debt collector, they always, always, always have to remind you. They are a debt collector. The idea is so that you always know this is not your friend. This is a debt collector. So be careful what you say. Okay. And so any questions or comments on that before we go to the next slide here? Make sure I'm looking at the comments correctly. So I don't see anything yet. So I'll check those again in a second. But how about a Facebook message to you? So, you know, you're on Facebook or you have the Messenger app on your phone and all of a sudden there's a message that pops up and, you know, you open it up and it turns out it's from a debt collector. They're trying to collect a consumer debt. Remember, we have to have a debt collector with a consumer debt and you have to be a human being, which I presume you are. And hopefully there's no, uh, you know, 
fake bots on this webinar today. So what do you think about that with the Facebook message to you, just a direct message to you through Facebook and they are trying to collect a debt. And so John says, not legal communication. Okay. Uh, Maria says, same thing. Let's see here. If anybody else has a comment. Yeah, same thing. Um, Fleur says, not legal due to personal information. Warren says, sounds like money. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. So the short answer is it, it's basically the same as a text message. Okay, we, we got to know, is this the initial communication? Uh, is this subsequent communication? Does it have the 16I2G or do they send that within five days? But this has uh, some other implications. Okay, and I didn't put these on the screen, but this is really uh, Flora's comment, you know, not legal due to personal information. And, and it, it kind of gets to, well, whose account is this? Okay, so like I have a Facebook account. I never use it. I mean, I use it for business purposes, but not my, my personal account. But that's John Watts, okay? Now I have friends that, you know, they're it's a husband or a wife, married couple, and they have both their names on there, okay? Or maybe it's a parent and a child are on there. So then you go, well, who's actually looking at this? Now, if it's a spouse, and we'll see this in a moment, a spouse is really considered the same as the consumer. But it might be a fiance or, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend type of thing. And so then we start getting into now we're disclosing personal information, not knowing who is really seeing that. Now, that could be true on, you know, a cell phone. But I was when I mentioned a text message, I really meant on your personal cell phone. OK, not a cell phone that somebody else has used. Yeah. So John mentions third party and we're going to get to those rules specifically. The point is, any anytime this stuff happens, we want to go through the statute. And, you know, I have videos where I go through literally every section of the FTCP. I didn't want this webinar to be that way. I wanted to use some examples so we could learn the statute this way. But certainly we look at, has a third party seen this information? And we'll talk about what a third party is. So how about a voicemail? Okay, so we're not talking about a text, not talking about a Facebook message, just... You know, you look down, oh, I've got an unknown call and I don't answer it, goes to voicemail, and then I listen to that voicemail. Would a voicemail be allowable or would it be illegal for a debt collector to leave you? And so Marie says, hmm, <laughs> I like that. So uh, what do you think? Voicemail, legal, illegal? Or, you know, how I guess we still do this in school, you know, I have like the, the scantrons. I hope we still have scantrons or else I'm like really, really dating myself. But when I went to school, we had scantrons and you have a pencil and you fill in the little, you know, A, B, C or D. And, and my rule was if I could never figure out which one it was, I would just guess C. I don't know why. It just seemed like, you know, that was a good idea. And uh, so, you know, the, the option C here is it depends, right? Let me see what we've got. So Warren says, uh, what if you have a company cell phone you also use for personal, but the company can look and check at any time? That's a great, great point, Warren. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of cover that. And we're really going to see that in the new rules that come out November 30th when we're talking about email, okay? Is it a work email or is it a sort of public email by public. It's not the right expression, but gmail.com. Okay. So, you know, I have a John at wattsherring.com. I have a John G. Watts at gmail.com. Well, if a debt collector is looking at that, the gmail.com, they can say, well, that looks like a personal account, but something that's not that, you know, bankofamerica.com or, you know, us.gov, you know, that's obviously not a private email. And so the company could read that. So let's see. Uh, Flora says, think it could be in the same category with text. Facebook, Maria says, think it'd be illegal if they left info about the debt, like the amounts. Uh, John says, uh, is it pre-recorded? Is there complete information on the caller? Uh, Jeff says, likely it's allowed, but disclosure required. But what if third party hears the voicemail? 
those are all fantastic comments. So let's look at some of the, the statute here. So again, we have that E11 that we've been talking about. So is it the initial communication? Well, if it is, then they need to tell us, okay, all this stuff. But in any communication, they need to say, hey, this is from a debt collector. And normally, really what the case law says is they need to say, this is a debt collector, you know, in an attempt to collect debt. But then we have this other section, 1692D6, that says, except in section 1692B, which we'll cover that in a, another slide, placement of telephone calls without meaningful disclosure of the caller's identity. So here's what the collector has to think about. They're leaving a voicemail on my cell phone. Okay, now let's assume that I identify this. Hey, this is John Watts. You know, please leave a message. It's a little different than if it's sort of a generic, you know, please leave a message, you know, at the tone type of thing. But they've got to say, okay, now we've got to tell him who we are or we violate section D6. And we also have to say, this is a debt collector. We're attempting to collect the debt. They got to give me this whole spiel. Okay. And their concern with that, though, is what if somebody hears it? So I think that, um, yeah, Jeff said, uh, you know, what if third party hears it? Okay. You know, what if I listen to my voicemail on speakerphone? Okay. Or what if it comes through, you know, it's like connected to my car and uh, it starts playing out on Bluetooth. Okay. And somebody overhears it. Well, that can be a problem. All right. Now, it gets a little more detailed, you know, did I sort of do that intentionally or did somebody overhear it, you know, through no fault of my own and how much effort do I have to make? So there are definitely some issues there. John also talks about, what about do not call? So the do not call list is really for the TCPA, so Telephone Consumer Protection Act, when we're talking about telemarketing calls. So collection calls are not covered by being on the do not call list. It's really telemarketing, okay? And so, uh, and we can do a whole webinar on the TCPA. There's been a lot of change. Uh, there's a actually a unanimous U.S. Supreme Court decision this year that made some pretty major changes to it. But still, the TCPA has a lot of power. So let's um, kind of hold this thought and let's change it to your home phone now. Okay, so not your cell phone, but your home phone. And, you know, do you think it would be the same analysis? Would it be any different? What are your thoughts about that? So we're talking about a collector that leaves you a voicemail. And, and think about what, what would be allowable or to flip it around, what would be illegal about a voicemail? So should they identify themselves? Should they say, hey, I'm collecting a debt? Who I'm collecting a debt against? Um, should they you know, leave any threats on there? What should they do? And let me uh, go ahead and turn to the slide. So this is similar to what we had before. Okay, so you'll recognize this E11 and then this D, but now we're adding some of this about third parties, okay? And we've kind of been hinting at this, and, and you guys have been bringing it up. Yeah, John says third party may get the message. Um, let's see, Kate says, sorry, on the road, can't participate. No, that's no problem. So definitely, have, you know, be safe and everything. Uh, so let's look at this. What does actual statute say? Okay, so uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of roadmap, E is for lying, D is for harassing, B is how do you communicate, okay, with third parties. And so, and that's literally in the, the title here, this uh, B, section B, subsection B. And so it says, without the prior consent of the consumer given directly to the debt collector, a debt collector may not communicate in connection with the collection of any debt with any person other than the consumer or his attorney, uh, consumer reporting agency like Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. The creditor, in other words, if, if a collector 
it, let, let's say that a hospital sends my MRI bill out to XYZ debt collector. Well, that debt collector can communicate with the hospital. That's not a third party violation. It makes sense because that's who hired them. Okay. Uh, the attorney of the creditor or the attorney of the debt collector. So all these things kind of make sense. The one thing that, and this is why I put it down here, consumer includes the spouse or the parent, if the consumer is a minor, be pretty unusual, guardian, executor, administrator. So what this means is they leave a voicemail on your home phone, okay, whether you have you know, an old answering machine, whether you just have voicemail through AT&T or whoever it might be. And your spouse hears that. Well, then that's not a third party disclosure. But what about your kid? We say, well, that's all in the family. So it's okay. No, we come back here. You know, it says other than the consumer and the consumer includes your spouse, not your kid. Okay. So you have a 10 year old, you have a 40 year old kid. Okay. What about your brother, your sister, your cousin, a guest staying there? I, I had several cases involving a very nice client and she was blind and she would have somebody come over and would help her. So she was doing a lot of research and stuff, but she just needed some help around the house and just, you know, like if she needed to go somewhere, this person would drive her. So as the message is being left on the answering machine, and, and so we're talking about sort of a real answering machine, then, you know, the, she didn't pick up the phone and the message is being left. It's being left out loud. Well, this third party overhears it. And when I sued the collectors for that, well, you know, that's kind of like a spouse. No, it's not kind of like a spouse. You know who a spouse is? A spouse, okay? A friend, a boyfriend, a fiance is not a spouse. A spouse is literally a spouse, okay? But I've also had cases where, you know, we hit play on the answering machine, or again, we're doing it on speakerphone, and maybe, you know, maybe we, we have the telephone and we set it down and we don't realize a third party is walking in the room or they can hear this. Well, then that would be a third party disclosure. Okay. And we still have all this stuff about they have to have uh, meaningful disclosure. Is this the initial communication? And if there's a third party involved, almost by definition, they're going to violate the FDCPA. Let me see here. Fleur says, uh, should I identify themselves, but should only allow if it's my personal phone, still kind of touchy situation. Yeah. So here's how debt collectors, I'll give you a couple of ways they try to get around this. They'll say, we have a very important private message for Jeff. If you are not Jeff or Jeff, if there are other people around that can listen to this, please hang up. Please stop this message. We'll give you five seconds to either make sure you're in a private situation or to hang up on this message. And then they'll do a little countdown. And then they say, because you're still listening, then you promise and represent to us that nobody else is listening. And you are in fact, Jeff, blah, blah, blah. We are a debt collector. We're trying to collect this debt. Well, that's cute. Okay. But nowhere in the law, I mean, I have the law up on the screen. Does it say you can put the burden on the consumer to, you know, you've got five seconds to scramble. Okay. I mean, imagine, you know, your mother-in-law comes over and she hears the first part of that message. What are you going to do? You know, you, you like hang up and she, she got to say, well, Jeff, what was that call about? <laughs> okay. It obviously ain't good. Right. <laughs> when whoever's leaving the message is like, make sure everybody's out of the way. Nobody can hear this. Okay. It's obviously, it's something very negative and almost certainly a debt collector. So the other way that they've argued this, and, and this was something they did to the 11th Circuit. So that's the federal appellate court where I practice. It's over Alabama, Georgia, Florida. And they said, look, <laughs> yeah, Jeff said price slip and fall rushing to the phone. That's right. And then we could talk about, do you have a personal injury case, right? Is that foreseeable? They leave that kind of message that I might like have a slip and fall trying to rush to my phone. Okay. But, so a company gets sued for this and they said, look, we're in a no-win situation. We have to disclose that we're a debt collector. We're trying to collect the debt. We have to have meaningful disclosure. 
But if a third party is there, then we've disclosed that the debt exists. Okay. And so it's a no-win situation. So obviously we should win. And the 11th Circuit said, guys, what are you doing? You have no God-given right to leave a voicemail message. Here's a concept for you. Send a letter. Okay. How about you do that? How about you not leave a voicemail? You're purposely putting yourself in this position where you're like, well, now I'm going to violate one statute or the other. Well, guess what? Don't violate any statute. Okay. And they, they quote sort of a famous line that's attributed in the Vietnam War that we had to, you know, destroy the village to save the village. Well, you know, whatever you think about the war, how about you just don't violate the statute? You know, don't violate section 1692E11. Don't violate D6 and don't disclose to third parties. If you're uncertain, you're like, I don't know. Can we do that? How about you not do it? Okay. There's, there's a good idea for you. So they have a lot of issues leaving these voicemails and that would include on our cell phone. Okay. Now, they maybe have a little bit better argument if it's our cell phone that, you know, and I identify myself, Hey, this is John Watts. You know, leave me a message. Well, maybe they have a better argument that I shouldn't play it out loud on, you know, a crowded subway. Right. But still somebody else could have my phone. You know, I, I could, you know, Warren says, Hey John, can I borrow your phone? I'm like, yeah. And a call comes in and maybe he accidentally hits play and, you know, it's like it's being disclosed and that's just the danger. So leaving a voicemail is very, very dangerous for debt collectors and most don't do it. But if you have one doing it, I would sure like to listen to it because I always like to see what they're doing to try to avoid this situation. All right. So how about they call your work? Okay. And, and let's make it sort of a traditional setting, not like you're working from home, but you know, you're, you're in an office, you're at a factory, you're at a restaurant and they're calling your work for you. Okay. So for uh, Maria, they're, they're calling like, Hey, you know, we were trying to reach Maria. Does that violate the law? Can they call your work at all? Does it matter how many times they call your work? Can they leave a message with your manager, with your supervisor, your coworker, your receptionist? What can they do when they're calling your work? So what are your thoughts about that? So Maria says they can call. They just can't leave a message. Okay. That, that's a very interesting answer. And, and we'll look at that. Uh, let's see. Unless I tell them I can't take calls at work. Very good. So that's that's a big part of this. Uh, what's a workplace policy? Did you give consent? Okay. Uh, that's from John there. So any, let's see, Jeff says, I don't think they can call your work at all. Okay. So we'll, we'll check out that answer as well. And let's go ahead and just look. So uh, Gerard says this could be considered harassment. Yeah. There, there's always sort of an underlying thing of if what they're doing is intended to be harassing, then that's going to be a problem. So let's look at 1692C3. So section C is communications. So that's where we get our cease and desist letter or refuse to pay that we covered when we went over dispute letters. Uh, so again, we have sort of the beginning of the statute and then we have the definitions Section B really has to do with third parties. C is communication. D is harassment. E is lying. F is unfair. Okay. And then G is that idea of they have to send you this validation notice and you got 30 days to dispute all that type of stuff. So 1692C3 says they can't call you at your place of employment if they know or have reason to know that the consumer's employer prohibits the consumer from receiving such communication. So go back to Maria, what she says, look, I can't take these calls at work. We're not allowed to take these types of calls. Uh, John says, what's the workplace policy? So if the collector knows or they should know, hey, we're not allowed to make these types of calls. In other words, non-business calls to 
the place of employment, then that would violate the law. Now they could tell, they, they could find this out because I tell them like, look, don't ever call me at work. I'm not allowed to get these calls at work. Guess what? They call you again. Boom. They violated the law. But what if it's a, um, let, let's just to make it easy, say it's a big company. You know, they're calling, um, I don't know, Starbucks. Okay. And, and I've never worked at Starbucks. I don't know what the policy is, but I'm assuming the policy at Starbucks is don't take personal calls. In other words, we're only supposed to get business calls at work. And so they call you there and, and they find out there's a policy. Don't make these calls at work. Well, then they get somebody else who also is at Starbucks. Well, they know I'm not supposed to call Starbucks, but they call anyway. So that would be the know or have reason to know that you're prohibited by your employer from getting this type of communication. And so that would be the starting point. And then remember, we have that D6. It says you've got to disclose the identity. So, you know, now we start getting into a little bit of tension here because if I'm calling and, well, let's, let's back up. Let's say they're calling my personal number or, or my direct dial at work. Well, nobody else is going to know about it unless they leave a voicemail, then somebody might. But just calling, they're not going to know. But if I say, look, I'm not allowed to get these calls at work, they call again, boom, we sue them. Well, what if they're calling the receptions? What if the phone rings to your manager or it's just sort of a you know an open work area and, and everybody's phone rings? And somebody else, you know, Bob answers the phone. Well, what can this person do? Okay. Can they say, hey, Bob, I'm a debt collector and I'm really trying to get, you know, uh, reach Gerard here because we're collecting this. That Well, no, that would go back to what we said about a third party disclosure. Okay. So that's why we've got this BB down here, you know, may not communicate with any person other than the consumer. Okay. And then let's see, Jeff says, um, or Marie says, you know, they may say, Hey, I'm calling about a personal matter. Okay. Well, so they could, they could probably do that with the receptionist. Okay. But if the company's name reveals, like if if this is ABC debt collector, well, they can't say, by the way, this is ABC debt collector uh, calling about a personal matter. Okay. Now, if they, uh, you know, why? And uh, I think somebody asked that. Yeah, Jeff says, what they use a ruse to get through to you at work. So they lie. You know, they say, hey, um, I- I'm a potential customer and I want to get back with Maria on the sales order. And then you say, hey, this is Maria. And they go, Maria, you've been dodging my calls. You know, you're going to have to pay this debt. Well, I don't have it on the screen, but <laughs> Maria says what they usually say. Yeah. So remember we talked about, uh, let me see if I can go back to kind of this real quick little summary here. You know, we've been talking about communicating improperly, harassing, how about lying? Okay. And that could be to, you know, your receptionist, it could be to your coworker. So if they're lying or they're being unfair or they're harassing and all those things would be true if they lie and say, Hey, uh, I'm a potential customer. You know, uh, I'm supposed to call Maria back. Well, they lie. Just like I, I remember I sued a company. It was probably like 20 years ago. They called my uh, client and said, uh, Hey, you know, uh, is this Maria? And, you know, Maria's like, Well, who's this calling? They say, Well, this is, you know, Susan Smith. I'm a paralegal at the estate planning law firm, of blah, blah, blah we're trying to track down the heirs to a very large estate. And uh, Maria's like, really? And they go, yeah, we think you're one of the heirs. It's a $10 million estate and we're having trouble finding anybody to give this money to. Is this Maria Smith? They're like, well, yes, it is. And then of course they go, well, Maria, let's talk about that $214 debt that you owe us. Well, I sued them. And I remember the compliance officer called me and he, he got my lawsuit because if y'all have heard me talk about this before, we, we don't ever settle with these people before we sue them. We sue them and then we talk about settling. 
And he's like, John, I read this. Please tell me that my collectors did not do the old, hey, you might be a long lost heir to a fortune. I'm like, they did. And he's like, I can't believe it. I'm going to pull the tapes. I'm going to fire that collector. How much do we owe you? <laughs> okay. So this is not like an uncommon thing where they lie to get through to you. So anytime you find a debt collector lying, okay, almost always that's going to give you the right to sue. Not, not literally every time, but almost every time. So let's go back to uh, calling at work here. So you know, do we have a policy against receiving these calls? And does the collector know that? Uh, are they providing meaningful disclosure? Are they uh, talking to somebody else? Now, th th let me give you an example here on this communicating with third parties. And a lot of debt collectors would disagree with me, but I'll just tell you, every time we've sued and we've been doing this for 20 years, they've always paid money. So here's sort of the routine. They call your work and in, in the collection industry, this is called a office party. When they do it to your neighbors, it's called a block party, right? Hey, you know, I can't get Jeff to call me back. Hey, just do an office party on him. And so they call all your coworkers and they say, hey, can I speak with Jeff? They're like, well, no, this is Cindy. Uh, Jeff's in the next office. Or, oh, would you have him call me? I'm just uh, really having trouble reaching him and uh, very, very important that he call me. Uh, let me give you my phone number. Well, we look at this and say, you know, was that a communication with the third party? May not communicate in connection with the collection of debt. It sure is in connection with collecting the debt with any person other than the consumer. It doesn't say their coworker. Okay. So they do that to like five of your coworkers. So all your coworkers come in, they're like, Hey, uh, somebody's calling for you, Jeff. What's very embarrassing. You sort of feel the walls closing in, right? Like everybody knows, like, Oh, did you get a message for Jeff too? That's really weird. I wonder what's going on with Jeff. So those are very good cases. And again, it's called a block party when they call all your neighbors because they want your neighbors to, you know, back in the day, put a sticky note on your door or text you or put on the community Facebook group. Hey, you know, somebody's trying to reach you, Jeff. Again, very embarrassing. And we sue them for that. All right. So how about this will be the last one I think that I have listed. So how about 12 times in a week on one particular debt? Now, they're not necessarily leaving you voicemail messages. They're just like, you look at your phone, you know, every day but Sunday, there's two times a day that this collector is calling. Like, yep, they're calling me again. You know, would that be legal? Would it be illegal? What do you think? 12 times in a week on one debt. So I'm not talking about 12 debts and they call you once per debt, but 12 times on one particular debt. And so we have uh, Maria saying it's legal, Gerard saying illegal, Jeff saying 12 times is abusive. So we got a little bit of, uh, <laughs> Maria says if 12 times a day, that would be, I have had those cases and it is interesting to see the debt collector try to justify why calling you like every hour on the hour is legal, okay? Uh, but Maria says 12 times a day, that'd be different. And part of the reason that I'd say per week is under the new rules, we're actually given some pretty strong guidelines on how many times they can call. And we'll look at that when we get to those new rules. And I don't know if that'll be next session or maybe the session after that. But here are a couple of things. So remember, 1692C is for communication. It might be you're represented by a lawyer. It might be you've told them I refuse to pay, which is cease and desist. But it's also this part. It says they cannot call you at any unusual time or place or time or place known or which should be known to be inconvenient. And then we assume that that is a convenient time. It's after 8 a.m. or before 9 p.m. Okay. Now, you might tell them, look, guys, I work shift work. That's, that's when I'm sleeping. Don't call then. Well, if they call, they violate that section. I had a couple that they had very strong religious beliefs that you don't do any business transactions on Sunday. Okay. 
And so the collector is from a foreign country and they're calling. And my people say, hey, don't call us on Sunday. You know, our religious beliefs do not allow us to, you know, do something like this business on Sunday. That's just a day of worship and to be with family. And the collector's like, I'll call you every Sunday. Well, you know, to his credit, he did call on some Sundays. And, you know, to our client's credit, they sued. And, uh, you know, that was a very nice settlement, okay? Because the debt collector knew that was a bad time to call. It was inconvenient. And it was just harassing to call. And then we get to 1692D, which section D says, don't do anything that, The intent is to harass or abuse or or things like that. Here's an example. Causing a telephone to ring or engaging any person in telephone conversation repeatedly or continuously with the intent to annoy, abuse, or harass any person at the called number. Okay, So that raises the question, is 12 times a week? Is that the intent to annoy, abuse, or harass? Uh, Now, I think we all agree with Maria, you know, 12 times a day would be, how about 12 times a week? Well, courts differ on that, okay? And when we look at the new rules, we'll see, you know, what the CFPB has said that in general, per debt, and they do distinguish it per debt, this would either be abusive or would not be abusive, okay? So I can just tell you, most judges would say 12 is probably, probably pushing it, and that's probably a jury question. We'll let the jury decide. You know, and it's not just, okay, your, your phone rang, so that's harassment. But if you're calling that many times, do you have the intent to annoy, abuse, or harass? You know, twice a day. We sometimes do it, I kind of play this game of, um, you know, sort of ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, right? You know, um, if they called you 12 times in a week, would that be like, man, this person's harassing me, (laughs) okay? And of course, debt collectors don't like that illustration, but it it does sort of illustrate for you, um, you know, gives you some context here. Obviously, it's a call you don't want, like, you know, plug in your ex-mother-in-law, right? If she called you 12 times, you know, you look down, you're like, oh, she calls twice a day, six days a week. Do you think that's harassing? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. And you know, that's a question really for the, the jury ultimately. So uh, any questions for me or that you want to put out there for the group about this communication? So we haven't covered all the FDCPA. I really wanted to focus it in on the communications because that is what is changing November 30th. And it is a massive change. What's coming up November 30th. Just um, it's not necessarily good or bad for consumers. It's just a lot of change. So part of the bad is collectors can communicate through social media, you know, direct messaging, uh, text messaging, your email. They make it very clear when that's allowable, but they also make it clear when it's not allowable. And the the one thing I'll kind of leave you with on this is about these new rules, just kind of tease you with it, is it gives the debt collector so many more avenues to reach you, right? They can call you, they can text you, they can write you, they can Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these things. The flip side is you can communicate back to them in this way. So the way that collectors do it now is they want to communicate by text But then if you say like, hey, I refuse to pay, don't ever contact me again. They go, well, hey, we can't be expected to read text messages. That's not reasonable. You have to send us that in writing, okay? Or they email you and you email back and they're like, hey, this is an automated email. We don't monitor the box. Well, the new rules make it pretty clear. Whatever path you reach out to a consumer on, that consumer can reach back out to you. And so there's going to be a lot of collectors that are going to be caught, you know, in a, in a bad way on this. So let me see what we've got. Um, yeah, Fleur says, great information. We'll like you to continue with this area. Absolutely. We will, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have some. This will be, I, I really don't know 
how many parts in this series, okay? But uh, definitely some more parts to covering the FDCPA. Marie says, I'm going off the grid. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, when we get through with these new rules, I think that uh, the end result of them is going to be, at least for a year or two, there's going to be a whole bunch of debt collectors facing a lot of lawsuits, okay? So when they decide to break the law against you, Maria, and for everybody else, here's how I view it. I view it that it's like a cry for help where they're saying, please, please take my money. And I think we should not ignore a cry for help like that from a debt collector. And so when they break the law and they know they're breaking the law, we should take their money. That's how I view it. And you know, I had one client, I don't know if I've ever shared the story kind of publicly here, but uh, I had one client that there was a debt he paid off, but the creditor said he still owed it, which he didn't. They would send it to a collector, say, hey, you owe us $500. Well, we don't owe them $500. So that's a lie. It's also unfair to collect money we don't owe. So we'd sue the collector. They'd pay money. And, you know, the next year, they'd go to another collector who would write him and call him. And we'd sue them and they'd pay money. And then the next year it happened. And uh, we, we became very good friends this client and I, and I remember like a after that third time, he goes, you know, I'm kind of getting used to this. You know, I, I, I sort of need them to call again so they can pay for my next vacation. And we, you know, sort of laugh about it. I think they finally stopped. But the point is when they break the law, take their money. I mean, that's the only thing that gets through to them that tells them maybe we need to like update our systems. Maybe we need to spend a little bit of money on training, spend a little bit of money on our computer system because they'll do this as cheaply as possible. Okay. And uh, take their money and that will make change. Let's see. Uh, Jeff says, can't you tell a debt collector not to call without having to give a reason? And if they do continue to call, then that's actionable. So Jeff, it's a great question right now. The simple answer is if you send them in writing a cease and desist, a cease communications, or it's all the same thing, a refuse to pay letter, then they're not allowed to communicate with you, including calling you. You can't easily just say, hey, don't call me, okay? Uh, because the refuse to pay, cease communication, it's just all or nothing. But if you remember, let's go back to our screen on uh, unusual time or place. So you could say to them, look, it's not convenient for me to receive a phone call at any time. I only want you to write to me. That's the only convenient way to communicate. Then that would accomplish what you're talking about. But you would have to sort of give them a reason. Just this is inconvenient. OK, so. Let's see. Uh, but Jeff, when we get to the new rules, now you can start saying, hey, uh, don't communicate with me by email. Everything else is fine. Or don't communicate by text message. We'll see if we can do that. And I think you'll find that very interesting. So Marie says, thanks, John. Good to know. You're very welcome. Uh, John uh, says, thanks for the educational information. Absolutely. Uh, Maria said, I had a debt collector try email. I responded through email. Yeah, and, and I would go back, Maria, to that first email if it's within the last year and see, did it include all of that information that we talked about? Let's go back to, you know, this, uh, what was it, the initial communication? And then also, uh, let's see, this G notice. Did it have all of this within the body of the email, not as an attachment? Because again, we've been trained. Get something from somebody you don't know. Don't click on an attachment, okay? Don't click on a link if you don't know the person sending you the link. So did they have this uh, 1692G information, assuming this was either the first communication or within five days of it? Did they have that in a link? Did they have it as an attachment? Or was it literally in the body of the email, okay? And then, um, you know, if, if it was not, the 1692G, did they at least say, hey, we're a debt collector trying to collect a debt? So I go back and look at that because it might be an illegal email 
And not saying that you should always sue every time they break the law. Sometimes we might have a $5,000 lawsuit and they have a $20,000 debt against us. Maybe we don't want to do that. Uh, but I definitely look for that. And uh, well, listen, guys, what we will do next week is we'll talk about some other violations. We'll talk about the new rules. I'm not sure if we'll do that all in one or I might split those up into a couple. I know when we get into the new rules, that will probably take us a couple of sessions okay, to do. Uh, but if you're interested in the FDCPA, just come back next week. Uh, I will tell you this. I think, I think I'm going to be on a plane this time next week, so we might have to do this, uh, you know, maybe Wednesday or something. Uh, but I'll change the emails and uh, alert you guys if it's not going to be on Thursday. Uh, there's a chance I may can still do this on Thursday at one. Uh, Got to see when my plane lands. Uh, or maybe I'll drive. I'm not sure. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll let you guys know, but uh, we'll definitely do some more of these and appreciate you guys being here and I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. So y'all have a good one. Bye-bye.